guarantees, so you also have guarantees that your program will be as efficient as it possibly can get. A few weeks ago, I drove up to the Cambridge Computer Laboratory to have a chat with Dr. Petar Valichkovic from DeepMind, Andrea Deek, who's a PhD student at Miele, and also Dr. Andrew Dudzik, who's a research engineer at DeepMind. It was a really, really fun day. You probably saw I already released one video from this, which was when we did a leak code challenge at the end of the day. Uh, Petter showed me around the Cambridge Computer Laboratory, so that was really good. And I also got to meet one of Petter's professors. Um, we did the main session on algorithmic reasoning and also a traditional interview, so that will come next. But um, I just thought I would release a few little extra bits that I captured. So while I was setting up at the beginning, uh, Petter and Andrew had a little conversation about category theories. They delved into the fascinating world of mathematical structures, such as lattices and groupoids, and their relation to category theory. Now, category theory is a branch of mathematics that deals with abstract structures, their relationships, and the transformations between them. It serves as a unifying framework for various mathematical disciplines and has applications in computer science, physics, and even in other fields. Lattices and groupoids represent different types of mathematical structures, with lattices being partially ordered sets and groupoids being algebraic structures which generalize groups. Their discussion highlights how these structures can appear uninteresting from a categorical perspective, but can still possess intriguing properties when considering specific cases. The conversation also touched on the concept of categorification, which involves uplifting problems to higher categorical levels while acknowledging the value of working at different levels of abstraction. Uh, Petter and Andrew emphasised the importance of understanding the problem at hand before attempting to categorify it, and they also expressed a preference for working with algebra first to gain a deeper understanding of the problem before attempting to generalise and lift it to higher categorical levels. Old school operators who had to actually take the punch card programs and like run them and so on. Yeah. So this was Rosemary Hill in front of the EDSAC, which is one of the first stored program computers that was invented here in the, well, the mathematical lab, as it yeah. was known back then. And she was one of the operators whose job it was to assist users of the machine. Yeah. Wow. It's the, the world's first webcam. This is the world's first webcam. To check if the coffee, coffee room was... Wow. It looks like a, a rack. Oh. It's got all of those old RS2, well, I would have said RS232, but it actually says RS423. <laughs> 2000 pence, deep mind technologies. Wow, look at that. <laughs> On the, uh, the Hall of Fame of companies that came out of the Cambridge Computer Lab. So this is one of the oldest versions of a computer that has access, that has like capabilities built into the hardware, so you can actually yeah. exercise certain levels of uh, secure access to various parts of memory. And yeah, you could like play with the different knobs, they're still operational. And ironically, aeroplanes haven't really advanced much since then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they have this very funky uh, prop in here, which is the door to the very first uh, computer science department that Cambridge had. And as you can see, it's called the mathematical laboratory rather than the computer laboratory, which it was eventually renamed to uh, at some point. So this is like, uh, very, very cool piece of history right here, um, which uh, shows the beginnings of uh, computer science research in Cambridge. And another thing that's very cool is this poster, which is right next to the door, which shows some of the earliest kinds of useful programs that have been, uh, that have been written uh, in this mathematical laboratory on these like really large computers that were invented here in Cambridge. And uh, these particular programs served to help mathematicians with some really challenging numerical tasks that they wouldn't be able to otherwise do. I think in particular, some of the codes you have in there perform numerical integration, which is a very important routine that mathematicians have to do and uh, is certainly not one that they can do easily by hand. So computers were certainly quite important for that. Now, I would like to direct your attention to this pattern on the, on the, on the glass behind you which is, maybe you wouldn't expect that, maybe it's a detail that might uh, not immediately come into focus, but it's actually quite relevant to the story I just told you. Do you have any idea what this pattern might be, Tim? Um, is it Morse code? No, it's not Morse code, actually. Although it, yeah, it, it does have like two symbols of different shapes, so it could be, but it's not Morse code, actually. 
Is it um, a punch card for a mainframe? That is exactly a punch card. And specifically, it is the punch card which implements that exact program for numerical integration oh, that you wow. saw on that. Incredible. Uh, with lattices. Mm -hmm. But then actually, like, almost everything I say is probably true if you replace the lattices with categories. So in this sense, it's like yeah. category theory. Um, like, the, anyway, uh, hmm. things can be complicated for different reasons. Like lattices are complicated for sort of the, the like orthogonal reason that groupoids are complicated. Right. Um, hmm. Groupoids have none of the interesting like relational like aspect to them. Yeah. Or like ordering aspect. But then the set of morphisms itself is like can be horribly complex. Right, yeah. right, right, right. So basically what you're saying is like, if you look at a groupoid from a bird's eye view, it really doesn't look all that interesting, just equivalence classes basically. But like the actual stuff that goes on in a groupoid can be particularly interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it depends on what you're interested in. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> but exactly. Somehow like everything you're interested in, is this correct? This might be correct. Like everything <laughs> of interest is some combination of like lattices and groupoids like huh. <clears throat> that should be true potentially yes mm. yeah. I'm, I'm liking this interview role that i'm that i'm having right now <laughs> right yeah oh this is gold i hope you're getting all this <laughs> mm. okay so basically what you're saying is that like when you say something is uninteresting to a category theorist it's because like when you abstract things away it doesn't look all that rich or is that what you're trying to say uh, with the thing category stuff? Well, I, I, I think that there's sometimes a, a misunderstanding of where the interesting part is. Right. I mean, I think I've talked to some people who like only want to work with categories. And then if something fails to be the most general possible category it could be, that's automatically uninteresting. But in, in a more right. fine grained sense, like if you're interested in some property, and that property doesn't go away when you pass to a special case, then maybe that special case is interesting. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, I guess that's a good point. Um, so so in, in what sense uh, would you say your thesis is interesting and in what way you would say it's uninteresting then? Um, well, I think it's interesting in that it provides sort of a good analysis of special cases of like general issues of concern in duoidal categories. Mm -hmm. um, actually, there was a funny moment in the discussion with David the other day where um, he ended up making this declaration of basically like that he has achieved sort of monoidal enlightenment, like that he's ready, <laughs> he's ready for his categorical products to not be Cartesian. Right. Uh, and to which I said, yes, but are you ready for your categorical co-products to not be co-Cartesian? Because <laughs> that's, to me, that's the real test of like maturity in this area. Mm -hmm. um, is like, because <laughs> uh, a lot of people working in monoidal categories, they're really, their plus still means plus, you know, it right. doesn't mean anything interesting. Huh. So. So I think like um, for understanding some of these issues where you have like the radically non-Cartesian and non-co-Cartesian case, I think my thesis is interesting. I see. <laughs> well, given that one of the first things we do in our paper is we try to redefine what plus means, is that does that make us interesting? Uh, I I think so. I think yeah. we're we're interesting, but at like too low of a homotopy level to uh -huh. catch much attention. But we can we can increase our, our homotopy level, maybe. <laughs> um, I mean, the point is integral transforms are somehow happening in the category of sets, right? And then all the stuff people are actually studying is happening in the category of categories. Yeah. So we're like a whole epoch behind. Yeah. But, that, but then again, doing it that way makes it easier for us to explain what we're doing to people who might know, you know, the basics of computer science and set theory, whereas not necessarily being super expert in categorical stuff right so maybe we can make the jump but we first have to like uh, gain traction if that makes sense that's that's right yeah. uh, i mean I, I would i would add that there there's no like working at a higher categorical level comes with problems <laughs> and the biggest problem i see is that people say oh you shouldn't be working down there and solving a, this problem down there you should be working up here but then they don't 
actual the problem doesn't lift like right. the problem that we're working on doesn't appear in the way that they've abstracted it right yeah. so they, they're claiming like we have a more general view or like a higher level view mm -hmm. but in fact they don't un they don't understand the problem and so <laughs> it doesn't appear in their description right so right. like I'm all in favor of categorifying when you know what you want to categorify. Mm -hmm. But before that, I no, I I I'm, I want to do algebra, you know, and then understand what I have, and then maybe be like, oh, what if it was a category? Right. Yeah, that makes total sense. Mm. <laughs> that was incredible. Yeah. We need to do more of that. Mm. <laughs> so I think you're better than this being uh, the seeding the this the. Um, we work on 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 GNN at uh, in in, uh, in well in Cambridge, but in, starting in this department, and also with uh, the, the the graph representation learning course that uh, we are uh, co-teaching uh, is also training uh, a new generation of uh, of young scientists uh, from every part of the world uh, to to do both uh, theory and practice. Uh, of, uh, uh, of graph representation learning. And I'm very happy to say that because of Peter, we, we, we can really compete with every body in this planet. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say that my second meeting with Pietro, back when I did not even want to do any kind of research, uh, he hasn't yet seen any code that I've written, and he said immediately, Pietro, you should do a PhD. Like, you should, you should not think about all this other stuff. Research is for you. You should do a PhD. So in many ways, Pietro's repeated convincing is the reason why I ended up doing a research career. So this is the, the kind of thing between an Italian and a Serbian man. So <laughs> it, may, it, may, it may work differently differently for Djokovic and his <laughs> Italian friend, but uh, we, with us it works very, very well. <laughs> yeah. We don't have to actually put this in the episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I can tell you from my perspective, Petar is world famous. So uh, I've, I just interviewed him at Neurips in, in New Orleans a couple of months ago, and uh, I'm following him around. <laughs> so, I mean, you have graphs every, everywhere, Yes. And he's creating graphs everywhere. <laughs> so that is the point. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. Cheers. Okay, so yeah, I've just finished uh, recording with Petar Velichkovic and uh, Andrea and Andrew. And it was a great day. Yeah, I'm absolutely knackered just holding the uh, the gimbal and the heavy camera doing the recording and stuff. But um, yeah, we finished off with the leak code challenge, which I thought might get a lot of views and interest. But yeah, we spoke all about algorithmic reasoning and a little bit about categories at the beginning. So um, yeah, great trip. Um, I'm up in Cambridge, so it's about an hour and a half's drive away from, from my place. But yeah, looking forward to publishing it. Cheers.